today. I worked all the way over at the kitchen table. What a what a change of scenery. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Sorry. Oh yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for remembering. Okay, we're recording. And so we just, this, maybe maybe we can have a, a, a function that throws an error if we don't start recording. Oh yeah, that would be that'd be great. Uh -huh. Um, and now yeah, and I'm, I'm realizing I uh, messed up some sharing and formatting. So I think those condition objects on the bottom is supposed to be the next slide. Uh, gotta put the dashes before the next slide, not after. Uh, anyway, okay. So in terms of, I was trying to talk myself through um, what's actually happening in these handling functions because um, they, they're really important. <laughs> uh, so try, within try catch and with calling handlers, um, there's the protected code, which is inside the brackets. Um, so that's the code that runs when the error is thrown. Um, so when try catch or with calling handlers recognizes the, the condition, that it's looking for, um, the code within the brackets, the protected code is run. Um, and that's evaluated in the environment where try catch is called for try catch um, and where with calling handlers is called uh, for with calling handlers. And then the handler code itself is the message equals or error equals or uh, warning equals function um, CND at this point. And uh, CND is the condition argument. Um, Hadley says it's just a convention to call it CND um, and you can customize it later. So uh, this is the, when we say handler code, this is the part we're looking at and then the protected code or the code that's actually evaluated when we find that is what's in there. Um, took, me a, <laughs> took me a minute to, to dial down on what we're saying there because I haven't used these before. Um, I oh, have a whole slide on condition objects one away. Oh, oh, it's probably trying to be at the bottom of this. My bad. Uh, that's okay. We can come back to that. Uh, so we talked about ex exiting handlers. Uh, try catch registers exiting handlers, which are typically the errors and the interrupts. Um, and it overrides the default error behavior. So uh, if it's signaled, control passes to the handler and the code exits. Um, so uh, for example, we get our, you know, we just have a very, an example here. We're saying if uh, there's an error when we're trying to take the log of X, we want our error to return NA. If it doesn't catch an error, it just executes normally. Um, so I guess it's, if you don't have an error, it's fine. <laughs> it's not going to cause you problems. Um, really apologize. I don't know. I was supposed to be on this slide. Oh boy, had a had an example. Uh, in this case, the code there for the error doesn't run, right? Yeah, I think that's what this slide was saying. Sorry, there was a lot of uh, tabbing back and forth between example documents, and I may have uh, deleted some of what was going in this slide. Um, yeah, I think the point was just that, uh, right, it's the, uh, the order that it executes in is important um, and was something or with try catch and the with calling handlers, which is actually kind of an ungainly function name, um, where it's going to find and recognize the condition and then what it's going to do can is not always intuitive, um, and I had to spend a lot of a lot of time sort of tracking um, where we end up. Uh, so as soon as we uh, find encounter the message, then the code does the stop, um, or d doesn't do the stop. It does. Uh, it prints there. Um, excuse me. All right, with calling handlers, um, this code doesn't exit. It executes normally once the handler returns. Uh, used with non-error conditions. Uh, the handlers are applied in the order that they're called and the return value of the handler is ignored. It's basically only useful for its side effects. So in this case, um, just an example of the order that we're calling things in. Um, we get second message first and then first message uh, based on where it finds it. 
Uh, you can muffle the handlers. So the default is that this condition propagates. That's not how you spell propagate. Uh, to parent handlers all the way up to the default or exiting handler. Um, so in this case, try catch is going to be the exiting handler. And then we've got within that, we've, there's a nesting with calling handlers. Um, and so we're going to get that with calling handlers, um, level one and level two. Uh, but we can muffle that with CND muffle, which is another R lang function. Um, and so that, uh, I'm not, I get, I like, if you can't tell, I'm not like particularly clear on why you would need to use that. I think this is probably what sort of stopped a lot of my really absorbing some of this information is because I haven't encountered a lot of situations where you would want to call a, f a call or signal a condition uh, sometimes, but not all the times, or you'd want to muffle something, or if you'd have a big stack of conditions, uh, perhaps is where that might come into. Um, you can create custom conditions, which is really useful for, um, you can kind of create conditions that contain additional metadata for flexibility. Um, so you can, it's creating a new class of object essentially and telling it, um, this is this type of error and you know you can do things further down the line with it so for example within abort uh, in the rlang package you can create this new condition error not found uh, which might be more specific than you know error not a character or whatever other kinds of errors you want to create um hardly seemed to stress that that was sort of important for um specificity and like differentiating it i think helps you write like better error messages or uh, debug better if you know what you're dealing with. Um, I liked this one. I liked creating a better error signaling system for the log function. So rather than just when you try to take the log of something that's super not a number, uh, it just gives, it throws you an error. Um, but we can write a, a, a non-specific error. We can write a better function that looks at whether uh, the problem is in the, argue, is in the, um, the, the base or the, uh, the numeral, the integer provided and whether or not uh, those are numeric, um, what they are if they're not. And it kind of helps you differentiate, okay, where, wh which of my arguments is the problem basically, which I thought was helpful. Um, okay. Uh, and that obviously makes these custom handlers easier to program with than the generic ones. Um, I liked this one, <laughs> the code didn't end up running, running correctly because there's this, um, a bad argument function that didn't quite fit on the slide, but you create a, a custom handler function for this sort of bad argument. Um, and then you could use it uh, within try catch to say flag this one if it's this particular, if it matches these criteria and all others just do this. I'm only interested in, I only need to know the specifics of this kind of error. Um, and the point to go with this was that it's going to, it's going to, if you have multiple types of error, multiple, uh, multiple handlers, it's going to return the first one that matches, not necessarily the best one. So if we had reversed this the other way around, other error, just the normal error function would have been the first one to come up. Um, there are some applications at the back of this, or at the end of this, there's um, returning a failure value. Uh, so if you want it to fail with something other than an error, um, return a return a an NA something like that. You can resignal these uh, the error messages to make them more uh, more informative. Um, this is similar to that um, warn option or option warn equals two, which is to sort of change. You can change the default warning behavior to be an error um, to kind of be on the more conservative side. Um, you can do a similar thing here. We created a little function that makes if it, if it's a warning, we abort um and treat it as an error um i think that was all i had but i was actually most interested in hearing from other folks uh if people have examples of particularly good applications of conditions or if anyone has like uh examples of conditions that they find really useful or really not useful um i've in i've used some like weird bespoke phylogenetics packages in my time that have like just the most confusing error messages in the world. And I think that's probably where I started thinking like, I'm just gonna ignore 
anything that's not the output of my code because <laughs> um, I just I didn't have a good way of understanding that. Um, but I'm realizing now, yeah, I definitely should have, or it's, it's, it's very interesting for me to kind of learn more about this. So if other people have good um, applications, questions, I didn't, I didn't include any of the exercises. I figured I could just share the, um, the book screen if we want to look at some of the exercises. Um, but yeah. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Abby. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, th I think, um, well, perhaps the most infamous condition, I remember if it's a warning or, or an er error, is uh, um, object of type closure is not subsetable. Uh, I think that one actually ends up on some t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, I remember we talked about that last week and that was a real light bulb moment for me. <laughs> I'm suspecting that this stuff will start being um, more intuitive for me once, like as we get in actually building stuff. Um, Cause right now it feels like it's nice, but I don't really see how it fits in the big, I can't think of use cases cause I'm not building stuff, I guess. Yeah. I, I did do, okay. So one of the exercises that I did was the one where it was, it was sort of like, change file dot remove to throw an error instead of a warning and <laughs> that's about at my level at this point that's that's about where i'm working at um but i did make it work and i was like okay yeah i i think i can see where i would want to have that level of control over things i mean i guess my i guess so the philosophy that he kind of mentioned is it's difficult to um difficult to write it, to use conditions super well uh, when you write functions because you have to sort of like envision how other people are going to misuse your functions. And that's difficult to do when you write them because obviously you're like too close to them. So I think there's, there's gotta be like a beta reading process for most people with these things, right? To know what a truly useful function or what a useful condition is. And if you don't, do that you're probably going to end up with non-useful conditions and, and, and thinking about uh, i'm trying to think of uh, messages that i've found either helpful or really frustrating and i can think of two in tidyverse um one which is i think is really helpful is if i do like a filter and i want to say um you know value is equal to 86 but i don't use the double equal it'll mm -hmm. say to me do you, didn't you, do you want to use the double equal? I mean, yes, of course, that's what I wanted to do. So that's great. I, you know, it's like, I don't, it's solved. But if I'm in ggplot and I forget, I can't use the pipe, I have to use the plus signal in ggplot and it throws an error and I'm looking at the code and it doesn't say you need to use plus, idiot, you know? And so I Google, you know, I go to Stack Overflow where everybody's called an idiot, you need to use a plus. And then, yeah, of course, I need to use a plus, but the, the pipe just seems like the logical thing. I'm just piping, 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 piping. So it's a very obvious error that, that obviously should be anticipated, I think. Yeah. Well, or like that the ggplot one, too, bring, if you forget a plus, God forbid, if you've got a plot with, you know, 19 layers on it, and you go in and you change one and you forget to have a plus, and then the whole thing breaks, um, but not in like a very, not in a specific way, right? Just in a like, I can't evaluate any of this, uh, which makes sense. But I wonder if there's, because then I go looking, I'm like, oh, did I type, you know, maybe I didn't type filter right. Maybe I spelled, you know, and it's always just forgot a plus. Um, there, there was something that happened today. I was using code that I've written like late last year. And um, and what I do is, is, is like every time it has to be updated, what I'm doing is I'm appending a new table to a master table. So I'm using, uh, and because I wrote the code a while ago, um, it, it, it always functioned. And then this morning I try to run it and it has some dplyr uh, commands in it and um, it breaks. And so I've got, it says, I, I see a data frame of 4,000 rows, but it says uh, you cannot subset beyond 3,900. And the hundred is what I had just, Add it in, and I, I was trying to to you know Google the error, and 
And then what I realized is that this is new behavior by dplyr 1.0. And what I was doing wrong, the way to fix it, I was using our bind instead of bind rows. And I don't know why our bind doesn't work because the two data frames have the same number of columns, all the column uh, headings matched, data types matched. I mean, but it was telling me that it could not subset beyond a certain point. Like there was, it didn't exist, even though I could see it in the data frame. But by changing from our bind to bind rows, I fixed it and I still don't know how I fixed it or why it broke in the first place. I was actually gonna put an error message in the Slack and then I said, hey, let me try this command and it worked. So now I have to wait for somebody else to have it break. And that wasn't like a cycling issue where it was reusing your data or anything? Like it wasn't, I've had that problem before where I was, I thought I was appending things that were identical and they were slightly different and then it just like causes chaos. Or it's a matrix on the inside of what you've just right. built in that. I, I honestly don't know because I made sure that same number of columns, I did a glimpse and made sure that they're the same data types. And then when I, when I used the, the rbind command, it created an object of 4,000 lines. But then I said, I want to filter this. And it said, you can't filter, you can't subset beyond 3,900. And, he said, and what it was saying is 3,901 does not exist. 3,902 does not exist. 3,903 does not exist. I get the point, you know? <laughs> but it was just this sort of, you know, it's like explaining to a kindergartner, no, what you did failed. Well, how did it fail? Well, what you did failed. That's what happened, it failed. And, 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 I, I, I continue to be frustrated, even in tidyverse, by some of the error messages that are, are simply not descriptive. And then, you know, if I have to copy the error message and go to Stack Overflow, it's already a lost battle. So I think a lot of, like they mentioned at the beginning, a lot of the errors that we probably see are from our before tidyverse and probably before a lot of this was even thought of uh, in more of a defined way, um, you know, especially the ones that you would repeatedly find on Stack Overflow are going to be those ones that are just like unbelievably vague and someone's just going to tell you you're stupid. Um, those are the kind of errors that I've mostly seen. Uh, I have used errors like this try catch stuff a couple of times in my code. One example where it was actually really useful was I was doing scraping of um, data off of a website. So I was, I was appending, or I was building basically a whole table of, of hockey player data off of a website that I was pulling the data down from. And uh, sometimes you run into issues where I'm basically, I'm pulling a URL for one thing and then I go to that URL and if that ever breaks, it basically shows that there's no player. And that would just cause the whole thing to fall apart. So I'd replace that with a row of, of NAs instead. Like their stats would just be NAs. Um, and that's really useful. So I would make sure that you know, I'm using the try catch there for when an error would, would be occurring. It couldn't, um, sometimes it would fail just because the, the website wouldn't, wouldn't uh, load the web page for me when I was trying to scrape it or things like that. So it was basically trying to be robust against a lot of these while using um, like per. And that was actually quite useful. So that's really the only time I've used it. And I tried to use it another time with warnings and I got really confused because the, the thing that it wasn't obvious to me with try catch is that it's it, it's an exit handle, right? That I didn't know that, um, and then knowing that now makes so much more sense. That like I hit a warning and I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just keep going. It doesn't keep going, so it was like it was breaking my code in a way I didn't expect. Um, so I found that really useful for uh, to learn here. But that's kind of my only main example that I've ever used try catch. Just like I have code I know is brittle and I have an unexpected result, but if I have an unexpected result, I want to have an expected outcome, which is like, just give me nothing, like a, give me, give me rows of nothing, you know? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense is, okay. So it would, maybe this is a, this is a kind of basic question, but the, would, would you like X, would you publish a package that had called your function within try catch? Is that like, is that a thing or is it kind of like a development thing that you would use while you're writing to try to make your function more robust? Um, Say that again. Would you, I guess, okay. 
no, you know what? I think I figured it out. So you have your, you have your, you write a function and then you, it runs and then you can run it within try catch to figure out where an error is. Okay. This seems like something that's going to come up more when we do debugging, add debugging to the long list of things that I've never done uh, really other than, you know, reading my code and, uh, and despairing. So um, Abby, if I understand your question, you're saying, uh, you're asking whether you put try catch in while you're polishing your code, but you would pull it out before letting anybody else use the code. Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of my question. And, and Josh, do, uh, or Jake, would, would you, so would you think of try catch as something only for you while you're composing or would you leave it in there? I mean, I think if you have the right kind of messaging to someone and it's a, it's like the worst case scenario, like if I was publishing a package uh, where it was pulling data off a website for someone, I might say like user not found or something like that, you know, and then, you know, user not found, you know, data populated with NAs. Like if I gave a message like that and it kept going rather than crashing the whole thing, that might be, you know, might be useful. Okay. So um, that's the circumstance I can see you having it. And I think that some of those examples that they had for the applications are like that, where either you're returning a particular value or you're using like a true false statement that you get from there after returning the whole expression for later parts of your code. So like if it failed, okay, avoid this in the future. Um, if it succeeded, don't, you know, it's everything's fine. Keep going, running all the rest of this code. Maybe that's kind of what you might do. So I think, um, imputing data, you could run that into that a lot. If you built your own kind of custom imputing, you might be like, okay, well, this was like, there wasn't, there's too much sparsity around the data point, so I couldn't impute it properly. Let me know that and then use some other form of imputing that maybe works out better for this, but make sure everyone understands or you have a log. Like that could be an example. Thank you. That helps. Yeah, I think try catch is really helpful if you have to iterate over something. Um, so you were talking about scraping data. That's like a good use case where you can um, make sure that it will continue, but do something um, when it encounters an error. I use it in shiny objects. That was the package I was talking about last last week. So part of what it does is it uh, reads the user's code, rewrites a lot of the functions under the hood, and then like like runs the code and populates it in their environment. So if they made some syntax errors or they have code like if they have errors in their code. Um, I don't want my function to break when it hits that step. I want it to try to like run as much of the code as it can. So I use try catch to, um, yeah, we're going to get into this later when we get into a lot of the metaprogramming stuff, but, um, yeah, I'm like figuring out all of the steps that they had in their script. That's now, um, it's a, a vector that I'm able to iterate over and I say, yeah, run that line, run the next line, run the next line, but I'm using try catch to, to do that. Um, so if it errors, it, it, I do have it just spit out the error and says it errors on this line so they can go back to, to that part of their script and try to try to fix it. Um, but I, I don't want my code, I don't want my function to stop running when it hits an error. Um, that's when I use it. Um, you could also use it if, if like your code um, could really be used on a lot of different data types and you're not really sure what the user is going to try to pass to you. Or if you have something like, um, like the data frame is going to return zero rows, but the rest of the function could still uh, could still work past that point, but something around like slice or something is going to throw an error because no rows were like returned in the data frame. I, I'm not exactly sure, but maybe like taking a couple data frames and you're binding them all together. But one of the data frames is is going to be zero rows. When you try to use slice from dplyr to to slice from that data frame, there are zero rows. It's going to throw an error that it couldn't find that line. I think it will throw an error because it couldn't find that line to slice. Yeah, it that. will. Um, yeah, so uh, then like your code would break, but it's like, well, I just want you to keep like reading these CSVs and binding them together, like binding the first row from every CSV. So when it hits that zero row file, it's it's like not going to know what to do. Um, so try catch would let it keep going. That's a great freaking analogy because I use safely from per okay. to wrap stuff in safely, and I but I I don't do anything programmatical with it. I just don't want it to bug me. Just you know. Yeah. And, and I think they like mentioned safely in per too. They, yeah. They, they, one of the exercises was to like write a little safety function. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to get some more of that. Wait, so okay, but Jake, would that be if it was going to, if it was going to keep going even if one of the data frames was zero, 
um, wouldn't that be with calling handlers rather than try catch? Since try catch exits? Well, try, well uh, with calling handlers, I think is for the messages. I'm still like a little confused. I'm like, I have more of a sense with your, uh, you know, maybe like, it's uh, your, your um, talk, but it is still a bit challenging for me to, yeah. to understand. Um, Mike. But I think. Um, Okay, because I think it has to do with when I think exits, I think, I mean, it doesn't just quit. It just goes, it doesn't shut down your computer. It goes back to the level that try catch was called from. So I guess if you were, if you're calling, oh my gosh, environments. So if you're in the parent environment or global environment and you're calling, you're loading in CSVs or whatever, and mm -hmm. you are doing it within try catch and you get to one that's not there it will quit and take you back to the environment it was calling try catch from, which means it would probably just keep going and calling CSVs. Ooh. I'm sure. I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm gonna like reread the environment. I'm gonna like, yeah, reread environments uh, to maybe So I thought our... that with calling handlers was more for like the warnings and messages, but I, I could- Yeah, it keeps running the rest of the code. Like it, it, hits a, it hits a message or a warning or an error and it then does the code that is associated and then it goes back and continues going on. So I think maybe the, the, the confusion here is that, Jake, you're just putting one line of code to do at a time within each try catch, right? So there's no more code to go back to. It's like, uh, check this code, then do another try catch, right? Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, yeah. Cause like if you did them all within a, with, um, with a, with handler, you would, it would keep going um but it wouldn't spit out an error you'd have to like you could maybe log it as you went though so you could you could kind of put them all in one um I find where i use it I, uh, yeah, so try catch is like its own function that I made. So I have this step called eval code, which is going to like evaluate the code that the user uh, has in their script. And then I'm using try catch to try to um, evaluate that code. And then that's in a for loop. So the for loop is, is going through the list and then uh, hitting try catch every time. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So it says, All what's right. the next line of code? Yeah. Uh, try it. So, so what I want to just, uh, so usually I would just say, um, you know, for I in the length of the expressions I'm trying to look at, um, evaluate them. But there's a chance that they could fail because the user like has a typo in their code or, uh, you know, did the pipe and the plus sign and didn't uh, yeah, you know, put them together correctly or whatever. Um, so what would normally happen if I just do that through a for loop, it would hit that step and then error out. And I think usually when you have those for loops, it doesn't put anything in your environment till it's all over. So like, I don't even get like right. up to that point of um, like <laughs> the result of the function. Um, so instead of that happening, it will like, I, I put try catch around it. So it like, tr I want it to evaluate. I hope that it evaluates, but if it doesn't, it'll just like keep going. Okay. I don't know if that helps. No, that, that already this like is helping me get a better grasp of how these things work in the wild, which I think is, is useful. And you made a comment earlier of like, how to know like what errors to write because you're like in the guts of it so much. Um, I just try to think about the assumptions that I'm making about the, the user inputs. Um, and then I just try to, um, I was trying to look at examples of when I've used error, but. Um, well, there yeah, was an like interesting if I, if I know example. that's gonna be some aggregate, I wanna make sure that the, the data is numeric in some of some kind, or if it's going to be, uh, it needs to be like no longer than a certain length of, of yeah. Like you can't call more columns than the number of columns in the data set, something like that. Right. I can, uh, can try to check for that and then throw an error. I usually throw warnings more than errors, but um, yeah. Well, and there's, I mean, within the handling section, it did have, there was a, a little bit on using it with unit testing. Um, 
and and that was sort of like using the condition object which i um had a slide on and it mysteriously disappeared but the this this like the catch the catch cnd um oh i had big plans i was gonna i was gonna figure out how to insert an image into the slideshow there was gonna be like a little kid fishing because it was uh of course yeah but uh, alas not to be maybe next time um but yeah this the, the idea of like the can the condition object itself has information is a list that contains information and you can use that with some of the like test that unit tests in a um seems like pretty succinct way honestly um which again is another thing that i don't do very much of but it's on the list <laughs> Did anyone have any of the exercises or quiz questions they wanted to talk about particularly? Some of it got very like confusing. And so I, I glazed a little on a couple of the exercises. I definitely typed, I didn't understand that, but maybe someone else did on some of them. <laughs> I find it really hard to, to digest, to be honest. I usually have to, the one thing that I um, can occasionally get success with, I can't usually just, I can't usually figure out the exercises, but if I copy in the code and run it one line at a time, basically, um, like a very slow, poor debugger, I can <laughs> and face just see what it does. That's usually how I can, like, okay, so the one, one I thought, which section was I in? Uh, 8.4.5, there's one where it basically just gives you, there's, it's got this show condition function and maybe I can just pull it up. Uh, and the one right after that too, I, I yeah, yeah. Both of these were just like, Ooh, <laughs> 8.4.5. Okay. Okay. So it was, well, I didn't, really know the first one either um, apart from the various differences between stop and abort but this one okay so predict the results of the following of evaluating the following code with this this function that takes your code and uses try catch if it finds an error a warning or a message and that you're supposed to run it on the following things and i I think I got, I got this one, the first one, right. That's an error. Mm -hmm. It finds an error. And then after that, I stopped getting them right. Uh, I think the second one, it doesn't error out. So it hits the null, which is the last thing and it returns it, right? Cause that's the implicit, um, the implicitly returned value by the function. But it doesn't just return the code like well it the runs code, code is, right which is 10 and then and after the code, code is, it runs null because there's no okay. errors and so it returns null okay okay that made, makes more sense that one confused me a little bit too but yeah i think it's just a lot it's the, the implied thing from functions in chapter six like implied to oh, right value. oh you're right okay like all this stuff is connected um <laughs> right okay and then like and then show condition warning i think i also did okay but this one, wait, no, okay. Um, you're still seeing the book, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So that one, predictive warning. Uh, and then the one after that, we got the actual, actual in output was message. So I guess that is, that's sort of saying, okay, the first so 10, if it, if it got to 10, that would give us null because there's no conditions. And then the first condition it hits is message. So it prints message and exits. And it doesn't get to warning because it's um, an exit handler. Yeah, so I basically replace code in the upper part with 10 message warning. And so it never, it never gets to null. Right, so okay. And then when it hits message, it's basically the exact same as the stop and warning calls. It just, that's the first um, handler it hits. And since it's an exit handler, 
it stops them. Okay. Okay. Yeah, in hindsight, that makes sense. When I made myself, I made myself in while I was running the code, put a comment next to it with what my prediction was, and my predictions were were garbage. Uh, but, <laughs> um, and then oh, Jake, did you mention the the one after that too? Is is the like? Yeah, it just made my brain hurt. These feel like horrible yeah, brain teasers I was given as a child during like long road trips. You know, when my parents are like, "Please be quiet." Um, I. I love these books that Hadley's putting out, but I tell everyone like, go read the book and don't do the, don't do the tests. Like it's yeah. just going to make, you're going to feel like, oh, I get it. And then you're going to do the test and be like, maybe I don't get anything. Like with the Arthur Data Science book, it'd be like, oh, here's all this great stuff with Stringer. And then the, the quizzes at the end are like almost impossible. And uh, it's like such a blow to your confidence, I feel. I think I get more out of running the example code by myself and messing with the example code to see what it does than attempting the exercises de novo. Um, but right. yeah, so, so in, I also here. did want to plug the previous cohorts have um, sort of like a questions and answers handbook that they've been compiling, which is mm -hmm. where I did, I looked at the explanation for this one and it was basically, yeah, oh, so. so you're going to explain it to us? I wrote it down. <laughs> I copied and pasted the explanation because I was like, I, I can't. Uh, okay. Oh, I, I, what I did type was, why would we want to do this? <laughs> um, that was my major question is why you would have this kind of uh, convoluted handler situation. Okay, so they said the first call adds a condition handler for conditions class, class message. Uh, okay, so that's the first one to with calling handlers and then executes the second with calling handlers function, which adds another condition handler for messages, which is A, and then executes the, co the actual code that's being executed is C. So like, okay, so the first call is, it calls C, right? Or the, the code, the first actual code it finds is C, mess, print message C. And, but when it does that, it also has to print A. I'm saying print, but I don't know if that's the right word. Return. Well, I guess because it, because it outputs a mess. All right. So it. Yeah. But it because it found C. that message, it has to print B. So we get C then B, mm -hmm. then A, because when we. When we find, or I guess when we find C, we have to print B and we have to print A. And then we go back up and then we found this message and then we get B from that one. So, so but the order is uh, B, A, B, C, right? B, A, B, C, yeah. This is the bubbling up phenomenon, yeah. which like, uh, I can see, where, again, I can see where that would be useful, but like, okay. Right. So, so is this saying like it, message C is created and yeah. that call has the calling handler then for message A be created. Yes, but and message A is caught by the yeah. outer handler. That's right, which so then makes a message B. Or like, yeah, which then makes message B. So message B is the first message that actually gets outputted. Yeah. And then message A gets outputted. And then we would like to have message C be outputted but it has to output message B again, I guess, and then it outputs yeah. message A. Because I think every time it hits the the inner handler hasn't been muffled. That's what the explanation that I got from the the other cohort was. Outputs A, and then that condition not having been muffled bubbles up to the outer handler, which calls message B. Yeah. So the I I, I bet okay. I bet if you muffled one of these. <laughs> It would change. <laughs> All right, Joel, I'm heading out. I yeah, I think it's about that time. Yeah, do another presentation. Oh yeah, biostats after this. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what I got myself into. They're asking about like which distributions to use and which circumstances. I'm like, uh. I'm so excited to watch the videos, but I just like I can't. I'm, I can't. I'm pretty sure that's got to be part of the class is what distributions to use when. So. I don't yeah. think you have to do that for basic probability. I was going to come ask you for help, Josh, if they really- Oh, God. I, keep you she in the noted background. me as a statistician, which isn't good. <laughs> All right, guys.
Maybe roll the dice on some distributions. <laughs> See, yeah. See you later. The coin, right? Letters. Yeah, yeah. Um, use whatever distribution reviewer two wants you to use. Um, yeah, this stuff is hard. I, I wish that I, I don't know. Okay, I'm glad. I felt like I just. Yeah, I felt like I just uh, presented nonsense a little bit. Um, no. Okay. I think, okay, I think if I had to distill the major ideas of this, I would say there are ways to flag conditions. There's ways to set them up for other people, and then there's ways to interact with them as the person who's encountering them. And there are some that stop everything and some that allow you to keep going that's basically what i got from this <laughs> yeah i mean i think the application so where you'll see if it has like any real value yeah um you know if you can find a use for it there but otherwise it's not really uh you know some of this stuff is very i think in the weeds purposefully to demonstrate how we could use it not how you really will or should use it yeah that sounds yeah. good I'm looking on the dplyr github to see where they're using try catch. Oh, that's probably a good example. Probably just go try to find it in the wild or I will I will try to like actually look for it um and stuff. I think I never I I just like the documentation on try catch it it just maybe it makes sense to some folks but like why is it function e like I just couldn't figure out why that was cuz it wasn't like really doing any manipulation it was just returning text. Um, so I spent a lot of time being like, what does it mean? Uh, but, um, yeah. I think I was, the one last you know, thing why it has to be a function, me. like I, why can't you just say, yeah, string? the, the like error equals that confused me at yeah. first. Cause like, why yeah. is it error? And I guess that's the, that's like the predefined handler classes, but like there's that later part where it's like eight or uh, error with bad um yeah um, when you start creating that class yeah so now you're making your own class of error there right yeah when you're defining it in a port so that was interesting yeah. like how that works but that's the, that's how i figured out like oh error is actually just because like that's the class that's, that's the class. predefined for a board whereas like if you make your own you can name it something else and i wonder if this will make more sense once we've gone over some like more object oriented stuff or s3 objects. yeah i think that's it's the class in s3 yeah. that's associated with that object it's yeah. like what how you define that part yeah. but i don't know enough about s3 to tell you why or how that works we're gonna know soon <laughs> all right i got you both to the other one as well all right cool see you guys later all right, all right see you We finished fundamentals. Yeah. Thanks, Abby. Sorry, yeah. I was like, I was only able to skim this chapter. So no, I <laughs> did my best. Thanks yeah. for sticking with me. Yeah, you did. You did a great job. Yeah. All right. Cool.